Thank you all for joining us today. I am Trista Kendall. I am from Stand.Earth, and I'm joining you from Seattle, traditional lands of the Duwamish people. Welcome to this Stand.Earth webcast, Crackdown on Dissent, When Protest Becomes a Crime. I'll now hand things over to my colleague and comrade, Christina Flores, our moderator and MC for the next hour. Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, I'm Christina Flores. I'm a campaigner at Stand.Earth and also a community activist here in Sacramento, California. I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Nisenan people. Um, we've got a lot to cover today um, in our time together and I wanted to take the time to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, I do, before we start, wanna call into the room the people around the world who are engaged in protest in its many forms at this very moment from people here in Sacramento demanding justice for Stephon Clark at the DA's office today, to indigenous leaders opposing the Kinder Morgan pipeline this morning outside Vancouver, and those protesting American colonialism in Puerto Rico. This conversation is especially important to me because I have engaged in a variety of tactics to push back on the state and its violence. These new protest laws directly impact my ability to challenge systems of white supremacy and the mass criminalization of black people in the US. And for those reasons and so many more, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. We have Rod Chapel, president of the Missouri NAACP State Conference. We have Irina Sirik, member of the Terminal City Legal Collective. Maggie Ellinger Locke, state, um, excuse me, staff attorney at Greenpeace USA and Kenny Mossett, Native Energy and Climate Campaigner Director at the Indigenous Environment Network. So from there, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Candy and Rod to talk about the state of protest today. Candy, you can go ahead and get us started. All right, I just wanna make sure you can hear me. Can I can hear you. you did. <laughs> uh, I just introduced myself, Dosha Madaglitz, Madashima A Ishuia Hetz. And so in my Herazo language, I said, hello relatives. My name is Eagle Woman. My English name is Candy Mossett, and I am from North Dakota, born and raised. I'm Amanda and Hiradza Rikara woman who now currently resides right next door in Montana, still fighting fracking that's happening in our communities. Um, and as such, I wanted to just talk a little bit and give you some updates about the, the Standing Rock. Um, I don't even know what to call it, <laughs> movement and let people know that just because it's not in the mainstream media anymore there doesn't mean we just went away there are several things that are still happening as a result of standing rock um, which was the dakota access pipeline uh, which we are still currently fighting against there's still current litigation from the standing rock sioux tribe um, against the pipeline a judge ruled that yes the army corps of engineers was wrong and that they did need to do a full environmental impact statement but he decided they were going to continue having the oil flow through the pipeline while they did these concurrent um, studies. And so the tribe now has um, some legislation coming up on, I believe it's the 23rd or 24th, uh, specifically against Standing Rock. And so you can check out more on our Facebook pages to learn about how to get involved with that, which is Indigenous Rising Media and Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, a lot of people don't know what's happening as a result of Standing Rock, but there were approximately 832 arrests that were made during that time that we were there. Uh, Red Fawn Fallis is still in, in jail as a result of that. Of those 832 cases, I'm going to give you some of the statistics and updates on what's currently happening. Uh, there are currently seven federal cases, uh, three of which are on plea deals and the prosecution is recommending three years of prison time for those seven federal cases. Um, there are 147 of those are proceeding to uh, trial of the original 832, 147 are proceeding to trial. 102 of those are in active warrant status and 316 have been dismissed, 20 have been acquitted at trial. 82 have been resolved with pre-trial diversions. There have been 120 plea deals with four of those on appeal right now, but there have been 13 actually convicted at trial and waiting to be sentenced for protecting water. And so it's, it gets me emotional. It was there for seven months. And the thing is, is that the extraction is still happening. 
in the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, which is where this oil for this pipeline is coming from. And so we're still at home fighting all of the activity that's been happening. But since Standing Rock, there have been 56 anti-protest bills that have been introduced into legislation. Um, several of those were in North Dakota alone. Uh, we have six bills in North Dakota that were introduced. Four of them were passed. And so they, these laws basically criminalize us for wearing masks or masking up, which a lot of people were like, what are we supposed to do around Halloween time with this crazy law? There was a law that increased um, penalties for riot offenses, making it instead of a class A felony, it's now a class C felony, which carries with it much more time in jail and much more um, time and penalties. And there is, um, uh, I, I should tell you what these are. House Bill 1324 is the one where you can't wear the masks. House Bill 1426 is the one that increased penalties for riot offenses. Senate Bill 2302 um, allows our Attorney General in North Dakota to respond to a large out of uh, protests by bringing in out of state officers as ad hoc special agents. This is my four year old daughter that might be in the background sometimes. Um, with her, she's with me all the time. Um, and then House Bill 1293 passed, which means that if you're on private property and um, there's no signs, you can still be punished and penalized as long as the circumstances dictate that you shouldn't have been there. So all around the country, these things happen. 56 or 58, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but just sit standing rock. So I wanted to just share with you some of the statistics and also talk about, you know, in Kinder Morgan, there have been hundreds against the Kinder Morgan pipeline, hundreds of arrests already in British Columbia and Canada. We have people like Cherie Foytland who's been fighting the Bayou Bridge pipeline, who has been having a lot of harassment happening, but I'll have some updates for you later on on that. Uh, and basically just talk about indigenous peoples worldwide. We make up about 5% of the population worldwide, about 1% or less in the United States but we make up 80% of the world's cultural and linguistic diversity, 80%. It's just so important that people understand this fight, this struggle has been happening since the doctrine of discovery, the papal bull, some people might know about it. If you don't, please look it up. 1493 is when this doctrine of discovery said that some other colonizers had access to all of our lands. And so the fight continues and the struggle is real, but we're still here and we're not going anywhere. And with these updates, please feel free to email me and I'll send you the exact links and statistics that I got from my good friend, Michelle Cook, who did a lot of legal work while we were out there. And um, we'll hand it over to Rod because I only had five minutes in the beginning, but I'll come back at the end to give you some more about what it is we're doing pertaining to the Keystone XL pipeline as far as the Indigenous Environmental Network and the fight that we're doing in, in the struggle that is very real, but is also very much, I believe, in our favor just because of our strength and our diversity. So, Matsigirad. Thank you so much, Candy. Uh, we'll pass it to Rod. And also, power to you being a mama and doing all this at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, absolutely. Thanks for that. That's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And it's going to be hard to follow, but I can tell you what's happening in Missouri. You know, Missouri has been a hotbed for protests of, uh, of a varying nature, uh, whether it's students at the University of Missouri campus, whether it's uh, the public outraged at atrocities such as the death of Mike Brown or the uh, Stockley verdict uh, in St. Louis, uh, or even uh, less militant protests, but nonetheless, uh, all the same viable of uh, the folks who did the journey for justice with the NAACP, one of the longest marches that we've done from St. Louis to Jefferson City, the state capital, about a two and a half hour drive, uh, much longer march. Um, Missouri's been racked by issues of social injustice. Some of those, you know, I've already referenced in terms of uh, Mike Brown being uh, murdered, whether the Stokely verdict, which is a little bit less known than Michael Brown's murder. Um, there was an individual who was thought to have been a drug uh, dealer uh, that was being chased by a police. 
Um, they, in the court opinion, acquitted the officer that killed him uh, just moments after saying that he was going to kill him. So the public was, uh, as you can imagine, uh, just, just outraged. Um, in, in Missouri, we have been uh, witness to sustained protests. Mike Brown who went on over uh, for months it, with, uh, with the Stokely, in response to the Stokely verdict, that went for a little more than 30 days. But even at the state capitol, uh, there were tw 23 clergy who were persecuted, in my view, uh, prosecuted by the local prosecutor, Mark Richardson, uh, in an effort to send a message that protest wasn't going to be allowed. Uh, simply, whether it was from the argument and closing of the, of the trial that happened about three years after they were charged with, get this, singing, praying, and reciting Bible verses in the Senate Rotunda, or the Senate uh, Gallery, um, they were chastised for being those people coming to town, to Jefferson City, from Kansas City and St. Louis, uh, as people of color, and that they might be some threat to children, that the children shouldn't be exposed to this, that we can't have this in our community. Um, we, we've challenged the prosecutor on those issues, and at the same time, sought for reforms in the way that we have these dialogues about who gets to protest and where, and what it is that they can do. Uh, I can tell you that many members of our state legislature took great umbrage at the students at Concerned Student 1950 who were uh, really left with no other alternative but to ask, why is it that when we complain that we're being treated inappropriately, called names, uh, mistreated by uh, police or other folks on campus, nothing's being done. Uh, so they, they, they did what uh, was reasonable. Uh, they brought the issue to the public and they did that on, on university grounds by taking uh, the, the quad or a portion of campus where they set up tents uh, and engaged in a protest there. Many saying that they felt safer there than they felt other places on campus because in social media there had been death threats simply against people of color on campus. Um, that's what's happening here in Missouri. You know, whether it's folks who are currently being prosecuted, have been prosecuted. Uh, and of course, we have joined uh, the long list of other states where there are uh, pieces of legislation that are attempting to be passed here. So at, at this far, thus far, they're simply pending. They have, not, they have not passed, but some of those include mandatory sanctions for campus protesters. That's House Bill 2423. Uh, expanded definition of unlawful assembly and new penalties for protesters who block traffic. That's House Bill 2145. And Senate Bill 813, heightening penalties for protesters who block highways. Uh, and then there's, of course, House Bill 1259 with the same uh, title. And then House Bill 179 for new penalties uh, for protesters who conceal their identities. Um, so those are all bills that have just been introduced this year. Um, I, I think it's really unfortunate. And most of the times, if you go to the committee hearings, they're talking about these in terms of safety, right? We have to be able to guarantee the people's safety on, on the roadway, uh, as opposed to what they really are, just the over-criminalization of, uh, of speech and our need to seek redress and do so in a, in a way that gets attention and brings some change. Um, and so I'd, I'd be happy to, to share more about that, uh, but that's what we have here in Missouri right now. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, unexciting and unfortunate news, um, but so very common in many places where people are protesting. Um, I'm gonna now switch gears to um, uh, hand it off to Maggie to talk a little bit more about oh, what we're what facing. We're um, sorry, I got some feedback there. I thought someone was talking to me. <laughs> um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what we're facing here in the U.S. I'll kick it off to Maggie. She's going to um, take uh, about 10 minutes to have a good discussion with us. Sure. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm, first, I'm thrilled to join you today. My name is Maggie Ellinger Locke. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a staff attorney at Greenpeace USA based in our Washington, D.C. office. And I'm also executive vice president of the National Lawyers Guild and have been lending legal support to social justice movement, movements for years. Both as an attorney and as an activist, I'm extremely concerned about the rash of anti-protest legislation we've seen filed, and in some cases enacted, in state assemblies across the nation since the 2016 general election. 
To be clear, anti-protest laws are not new and have been used to target social justice movements for decades. But since the election of Donald Trump, there has been an increase on the part of legislators to pursue these sorts of laws. So there are several broad categories of legislation that most of these bills fall into, and I'm gonna briefly talk about each in turn. First, we have highway blocking, which is of course already a crime in every jurisdiction in the country, generally a misdemeanor. Famously, Black Lives Matter has used the tactic of nonviolently blocking highway traffic to call attention to the injustice of police murders. Several states have introduced legislation that would enhance penalties for this type of protest activity, and even more troubling, there have been bills introduced that would ease liability for drivers who strike protesters with their car. So we've seen highway blocking bills enacted in South Dakota and Tennessee, and there have been several bills pending, including one in Missouri, um, and currently bills are pending in Iowa, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Washington, and Wisconsin. And we've seen these bills fail in Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Mississippi, North Dakota, Rhode Island, and Texas. That's 24 bills in total, by far the biggest category. These sorts of bills carry the potential to chill speech, discouraging activists from engaging in constitutionally protected conduct. The next broad category of bills concerns campus protests. This set of bills claims to promote free speech on campus, but in reality, creates incentives for schools to target students for protesting far-right speakers, people calling for genocide and deportation of the students themselves. And some of these bills go so far as to require schools to punish students. We've seen these bills filed in Georgia, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin, but luckily thus far, none have been enacted. Another broad category of bills concerns unlawful protest activity, seeking to widen the definition of riot and extend collective liability so that anyone present at a protest could be car charged with the criminal acts of others. So while not through legislation, perhaps the most striking example of this is taking place here in DC concerning the ongoing prosecutions of activists arrested during the inauguration of Donald Trump, the J20 protesters. Luckily thus far, juries have been loath to adopt the prosecutor's argument, but lawmakers are seeking to enshrine this sort of approach to the First Amendment. And we've seen this in Arizona, New Jersey, Virginia, um, and where those bills were defeated. Uh, another bill is still pending in Wisconsin, and we saw one enact enacted last year in North Dakota, heightening penalties for so-called riots. And that other broad category is the criminalization of wearing face masks. Note, several jurisdictions already have such laws on the books, often in direct response to the hoods of the Ku Klux Klan. But we know that such laws are rarely enforced against the Klan and are usually used to target leftists. For example, we saw this in Charlottesville last summer during the July 8th Klan rally, a month before the deadly Unite the Right rally that left three people dead. Such a bill was passed last year in North Dakota, and we've seen this introduced in half a dozen states. There have also been several bills outside of these categories. Bills seeking to charge protesters for law enforcement costs associated with protests. Bills seeking to explicitly harm the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israeli apartheid. And bills seeking to avoid the Fourth Amendment by spying on protesters with drones, as we saw introduced just last week in Illinois, and more. What is important to remember is that these bills have not emerged from a vacuum. They are a direct response to social justice movements and are in fact aimed at silencing those particular movements. They're not explicitly labeled as such, but their motivations are clear to anyone paying attention. And of course, this is nothing new. People of color led movements resisting the legacy of racism and white supremacy in the US have long been the target of repression from the FBI's monitoring of the civil rights movement to anti-picketing laws designed to target labor unions and so forth. The last broad category of bill concerns so-called critical infrastructure, by which I mean pipelines. Greenpeace has been engaged in pipeline protests for a long time. And where we're seeing this legislative attack, uh, th this is new. This is a direct response to indigenous-led protests at Standing Rock and elsewhere. Pipelines carry natural gas and oil, crude oil, which gets refined into petroleum products, often for consumption overseas and not domestically. 
And where we've seen these bills gain the most traction is in states key to oil and gas interests. So last year in 2017, we saw critical infrastructure bills filed but not passed in three states. Oklahoma enacted bills creating new penalties for trespass onto critical infrastructure property, as well as for defacing or impeding the operations of such a facility. Such activity could include simple civil disobedience of the highly nonviolent variety, the type that includes zero chance of intentional property destruction. The penalty range includes up to 10 years of incarceration and a $10,000 fine. Notably, the Oklahoma law also specifically includes a provision whereby if organizations, which can be prosecuted criminally, are found to have been a conspirator to any of these new crimes, the orgs themselves could be subjected to a fine 10 times the amount of the fine as that prescribed by law for individuals. Note, when voting on these laws, Oklahoma lawmakers made clear that these bills were a direct response to pipeline protests. Then in December 2017, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, introduced and then later adopted model legislation called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act. So briefly, ALEC is a right-wing organization that designs model legislation on a variety of conservative issues, including Stand Your Ground, the Animal and Ecological Terrorism Act, the Anti-Immigration Law SB 1070 in Arizona, and more. They have a tremendous amount of outsized influence and power in state assemblies across the country. And when ALEC gets behind something, it very often gets passed. And quick side note, another big entity that does this kind of work is the Goldwater Institute, which has authored several of the bills I referenced earlier. So this session, ALEC, adopts its model critical infrastructure legislation, which explicitly says it was inspired by the Oklahoma law adopts that in January, which employs a broad definition of the term critical infrastructure and creates new tough criminal penalties for conduct that is already illegal, or in some cases is protected by the First Amendment, and sometimes both illegal and protected by the First Amendment. So this year, we've seen several bills introduced, mostly based off of Alex's model legislation, and they have several elements in common. Typically, they, one, broadly define critical infrastructure, two, create severe- hey, we've lost your sound. You lost my sound. Ah, now you're back. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Sorry for that. And this will be a perfect time to offer you a time check as well. Okay. Moving along. I'm going to talk quickly. Uh, but bear with me. So these bills primarily do four things. They broadly define critical infrastructure, create severe criminal penalties for otherwise already illegal conduct, provide provisions for civil damages, and pursue organizations. Such bills are pending in Minnesota and Ohio, and the Ohio bill uniquely provides that operating drones over land that contains critical infrastructure is a new misdemeanor, and that organizations that engage in this activity or provide support to those who do could be fined 10 times the amount as could be imposed on an individual. And drones, I know, were used at Standing Rock, and media activists in particular have been great use of drones worldwide. Wyoming's legislature sent a bill to the governor that would have made purely First Amendment conduct um, uh, a protected conduct, a, a felony, but in a surprise move, the Republican governor there vetoed the bill. Um, for the veto, legislators made clear that that bill was in response to protests. And just last month, Iowa enacted a bill creating a new Class B felony crime, critical infrastructure sabotage, um, where uh, activists could face up to 25 years and a $100,000 fine. Um, in Iowa, some House Democrats offered amendments to the bill uh, that would have provided an exception for protests, but those were defeated. In Louisiana, where protests are ongoing against the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, a similar bill, HB 727, was introduced and activists were successful in getting a Senate committee to attach amendments like the ones offered in Iowa, substantially improving the bill. That bill with amendments was adopted just yesterday by the full Senate and now returns to the House for reconciliation proof that citizen lobbying can work. Now briefly, what we're seeing in many of these bills is that they are of course being pushed for by oil and gas interests. Some states, such as Iowa, require lobbyist disclosures. And because of this, we know that the Iowa bill, now law, was pushed by Jeff Boyink, a founding member of ALEC and a lobbyist for Energy Transfer Partners, or ETP. ETP is the company currently building the Bayou Bridge down in Louisiana, and also of course built Dakota Access Pipeline. 
So that pipeline, which became uh, operational in June of last year, runs from North Dakota to South Dakota through Iowa and into Illinois. There, the oil is refined and transported through other ETP pipelines into Texas, where it is sold potentially out of the US for consumption overseas. Thus, I note, this so-called critical infrastructure is only critical to the corporate pocketbooks of multinational corporations, and it is in no way critical to the people of North Dakota, Louisiana, Iowa, or elsewhere. What is also notable about ETP is that last summer, they sued my organization, Greenpeace, to the tune of $900 million. So we are now in the middle of defending this SLAP suit, that is a strategic lawsuit against public participation, a suit designed to silence us by burying us in paperwork. Um, and that lawsuit has been brought by the firm Kazowit Benson Torres, which is one of President Trump's go-to firms. The RICO suit attempts to rewrite history by putting indigenous communities impacted by the pipeline on the sidelines with lies about a criminal conspiracy. It is a baseless attempt to mislabel legal advocacy as criminal conduct through the use of racketeering laws and present constitutionally protected free speech as defamatory. I'm almost done. Speaking of action on the federal level, um, last October, a bipartisan group of members of the U.S. House of Representatives, 84 in total, sent a letter to AG Sessions urging the DOJ to prosecute pipeline, terror, pipeline protesters as terrorists, a move that is also being lobbied for on the federal level by the American Petroleum Institute. Um, of course, there's a long history of the use of the word terrorism to target specific groups of people. Um, and those tactics have not lost steam in the world of ALEC, which is controlled by the Koch brothers, as well as other far extreme right groups. So I know I'm way over time, but um, thank you for giving me a chance to be here today. I will say that you were not way over. Oh, you, brought well. us, you brought us right <laughs> to our moment, um, so we're good. Uh, we had a little extra time for you. So thank you so much for all of that. I'll sure. now pass it to Irina in Canada um, to add some more. Great. Um, thank you so much. I'm really grateful to the organizers of this discussion, and I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to be able to present today on behalf of the Terminal City Legal Collective. So my talk today has three parts. I'm going to start with just a few words about the general Canadian context in terms of the criminalization of dissent. Um, then I'll spend a bit of time talking about how injunctions and contempt of court in particular have been and are used to criminalize activism and organizing using the current struggle against the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project, which has already been mentioned as an example. And then I'm gonna conclude with just a few words about the politics of those legal tools. So I'll start with some general comments about the Canadian context, but um, I can't do that without uh, doing what other folks have done as well, which is acknowledging that I'm presenting today in Vancouver um, as a guest on unceded Coast Salish territories. British Columbia, the province is in fact mostly unceded. The majority of this province was never uh, surrendered via treaties or by other, by other means, meaning that the indigenous laws and protocols that traditionally govern these territories remain in place. Today, however, I'm talking about colonial Canadian state law and I'm using the colonial names for these territories. So as I mentioned, my focus today is not on criminal law, but on injunctions and contempt of court. And I'll explain what those are in a minute and how they're used to criminalize movements for indigenous and environmental justice, and particularly uh, opposition to resource extraction. So mining and logging and energy infrastructure projects such as pipelines and dams. And I'll be talking mostly about BC because BC has a long and somewhat unique history of using injunctions against social movements in First Nations, including of course the, the infamous Clackwood Sound uh, mass arrests and trials back in 1993. There's some exceptions in other parts of the country, um, and most, most of those are also struggles by Indigenous peoples um, around development on their traditional territories. So for several years now, for example, there's been protests in Labrador over the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric dam project, and injunctions have been used there as well. So what are these injunctions? What's contempt of court? What's happening right now? Well, an injunction is an order issued by a judge after an application is filed by a party to a lawsuit, and they're called the applicant. And it's meant to protect the interests of this applicant, whether they're a corporation or the government or an individual, um, while their lawsuit is pending, usually by requiring certain people, so in this case, land defenders, water protectors, protesters, to not do certain things. So in this case, say, block a particular road or prevent access to a particular site. So this court order, this injunction, requires an underlying lawsuit. 
But what we've seen in a pattern of in BC is that these lawsuits are really just a means to the injunction. They're not intended to be successful lawsuits um, and likely they'll never even be completed. Um, nonetheless, the applicant for an injunction will go to the court and say, this lawsuit is super serious, our interests are serious, they're being harmed by these protesters, and you judge, you need to issue a court order that will prevent them from interfering with our business. So this is actually a very low bar, legally speaking, and it's very rare for a court to deny an injunction in a protest-related case in BC. Um, although last year, actually, a judge did reject the city of Vancouver's request for an injunction to allow eviction of a tent city. But that case really is very much the exception. Generally, the BC courts are quick to issue injunctions in battles over resource extraction. And this pattern or practice includes injunctions not just against the named defendants in the underlying lawsuit, however tenuous that lawsuit is, but also, quote, John and Jane Doe and persons unknown, meaning basically me, you, anyone, everyone. Um, once the injunction is issued, it will generally include an enforcement order, meaning that the police in that jurisdiction are then empowered to enforce the injunction, to arrest people who violate it, and to charge them with contempt of court. Contempt of court is weird. Um, it's, a, it's a common law, judge-made offense. It's not in the regular criminal law in Canada's criminal code. Um, and this has repercussions that I'll get to in a minute. But first, I just want to quickly illustrate this process using the example of the very, very current Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project. I'm assuming that most of you know that this is an attempt to expand an existing pipeline that goes from Alberta to Burnaby, which is just outside of Vancouver. Um, and this they want to expand it so the pipeline can carry diluted bitumen from the Alberta tar sands. It's a, it's a tar sands pipeline. So in March of this year, uh, Trans Mountain and its, and its parent company, Kinder Morgan, sued a number of grassroots activists who had been pro protesting at one of Kinder Morgan's sites in Burnaby since around November. So this lawsuit is for nuisance and unlawful interference with economic relations, and they're seeking monetary damages and, of course, an injunction. So the injunction was issued um, after, after a court hearing on March 16th, right in the middle of a planned civil disobedience campaign um, organized by some of the groups involved today, by Stand and Greenpeace and, and others, um, against this pipeline expansion. So this injunction prohibits, quote, physically obstructing, impeding, or otherwise preventing access uh, to several Kinder Morgan sites in Burnaby. Um, and I should say that this is not Kinder Morgan's first injunction against protests in Burnaby. There was a, also about 112 people arrested in 2014 under a different injunction. So since March, there have been about uh, just under 200 arrests at Kinder Morgan's tank farm, um, mostly for contempt of court, um, although several Indigenous activists are facing criminal charges. And there's a, there's a very real concern that the arrests of those activists, some of whom are part of a longer standing protest camp at that site, were really disproportionately harsh, that they're being dealt with differently. So those um, 200 people or so are counting, there, there's a kayak action happening right now, so we might be adding to that count, um, are now before the courts. And this is where this really sort of particular sort of the crackdown on dissent gets a little bit unusual. And I'll mention three aspects. So originally, the contempt of court charges were being prosecuted by Kinder Morgan's own lawyers. Um, but at the sort of insistent request of the judge hearing these cases, the ordinary criminal prosecutors from the province have stepped in to take over these cases on behalf of Kinder Morgan. So we have a situation where BC's public prosecutors are now prosecuting charges arising out of Kinder Morgan's private lawsuit. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, second, the protesters were originally charged with civil contempt of court. Um, but the judge has since ordered that the charges themselves would shift from civil contempt to criminal contempt of court. Um, this is because of the, the so, sort of public nature of their alleged contempt, this idea that protesters are publicly and openly defying a court order, that they're thumbing their noses at the court's authority. Um, the punishments and consequences for civil and criminal contempt are not actually that different. Um, and this process of shifting the charges is not uncommon, but the activists facing these charges have, of course, raised a lot of objections to this process and its unfairness. Um, and finally, because contempt is not a regular or statutory criminal offense, the trials take place under a summary procedure that doesn't give defendants all of the constitutional protections they would otherwise have, at least in theory, 
Um, so for example, uh, evidence might be presented by affidavit rather than via a witness. And there's a currently motion about that. Another example is that a defendant, one defendant has brought a motion for his right to be tried by a jury, which is generally not how contempt cases are tried. Um, there's been a few guilty pleas so far, uh, but the majority of these defendants want to go to trial. Um, and that's going to be, I think, some interesting defenses brought by unrepresented defendants. For example, climate change necessity arguments. The judge has said over and over again that he's not going to allow any so-called collateral attacks on the project itself. Uh, the idea here is that the pipeline's been approved, never mind the legitimacy of that process. Um, so there's a valid injunction in place. And in the judge's eye, the, the question before the court is not, is this pipeline a good idea or not? But we've seen and will continue to see pushback against this by defendants. And we, the, the Terminal City Legal Collective, we've been working really hard to help them self-organize and support one another uh, to make these sorts of arguments. And for, for updates, you can, you can check our Facebook page and I think we'll, we'll post the link. Um, so we have these procedural issues that I've just discussed where the legal consequences of this specific form of the, the criminalization of dissent are different than in cases where activists face ordinary criminal charges, which of course I'm not making an argument for charging people criminally instead. Um, but I, I do want to conclude uh, with just a few comments about the broader politics of this legal framework. So as I mentioned, using injunctions brought by private corporations as the basis for contempt of court charges sets up this really strange process where the police, and in this case the prosecutors, end up enforcing what is essentially a private court order. So a corporation like Kinder Morgan can initiate a lawsuit, get an injunction to protect its property interests, and the police will be ordered to enforce that injunction to in fact create this sort of perverse public-private partnership for the criminalization of dissent. Um, you may know that the current BC government, the, the NDP and Green Party government, um, is opposed to this, to this project. But um, I think that this is still an example of, of an alignment of corporate and state interests, where you have the judiciary as one branch of, you know, what sometimes gets called the Canadian petrostate, really facilitating a corporate-led and directed law enforcement process. And of course, the fact that this is all happening on unceded Indigenous territories is, of course, part of a broader industry and state-led effort to paint legitimate claims by Indigenous nations as extremists. And I think the, Maggie just mentioned that as well. But of course, and I'll conclude here, this, this also sets up the justice system as a site of resistance by Indigenous land and water defenders, by environmental justice activists. Um, and I think that these cases are and will continue to be a very visible and powerful challenge to the Canadian state's professed commitment to reconciliation. I'll stop there and I look forward to some questions. Thank you so much. I'm just going to swiftly go ahead and pass it on to Candy so we can talk a little bit about uh, counteracting this kind of criminalization. Yeah, so um, again, can you hear me? <laughs> just make sure. Okay. So um, I was talking a bit about North Dakota laws, and I think that it's really important that we kind of like get on the docket and first of all, understand what these even are. It's really difficult thing to keep track of all of these different bills. Um, there are places you can go. I use the ACLU, for example, to go there and, and look for some information around bills that have been passed or that are going to be. And you can actually affect that by going there and being there and writing your dissent against these things. Um, you know, there were four bills that were passed in North Dakota, but there were two bills that did die in North Dakota. The House Bill 1203 bill died, which was the hit and kill bill, which would have allowed drivers to run over people that were obstructing highways as long as they believed that they did it accidentally. And it was a huge outcry. <laughs> and we went there and spoke out against it and it, it didn't it didn't pass and then house bill 1193 also failed which would have punished um protectors at private facilities um, and created penalties for those directly or indirectly um causing more than one thousand dollars in economic harm to the government or an individual and that would have carried with it um five years in prison and so that one died as well so those are two key bills that i think you know, it's good to know our, our like victories as well. <laughs> um, but I do know that as a person that I was 
just, you know, an everyday kind of mom. I, I work with the Indigenous Environmental Network on things, but I just feel like of myself as just an everyday person that has concerns. It's hard to keep up with all this stuff. And so we'll send the links for all these things that are happening. But the way we fight back, you know, it's kind of like fight fire with fire. Or, um, you know, these laws are supposed to be in place to, for protections of people. And we are people and we deserve these protections as well, too. So um, we're fighting, you know, in the bank system. Uh, there is something that is called the equator principles, for example. Um, those are guidelines that were signed by 91 banks, and each bank had promised to avoid negative impacts on the ecosystems, communities, climate, and wherever possible um, when financing their projects. So we're kind of going to like the root cause of these big capitalist colonialist systems. And the root cause of a lot of this is money and money flows through banks. And so these equator principles were put into place to, to not finance disaster projects, such as all of these that we've been talking about here today, um, but, but they're happening. So we did an action called equatorbanksact.org. So you can go to the website. The petition is no longer live, but if you learn more about the, the equator principles and continue to push back on these banks, that is extremely helpful. We've also found that it's been wildly successful doing our divestment work. And if you haven't done it yet or wanna learn more about it, if you're watching this, what can I do? You know, As an individual, this is so overwhelming. This is so many numbers. <laughs> and house bills. Um, the way we found it successful, again, is to follow the money. And so you can go to bankongood.com. And bankongood.com is part of a uh, Mazaska Talks. And I know I'm saying Mazaska wrong, but Maza, Mazaska, it's money. And, and so we talk about uh, money talks. And if you can start moving your money, we can be even more successful in our um, divestment approach. And then of course our reinvestment into our communities through our uh, just transition work that we're doing both in the indigenous environmental network, but in our larger um, It Takes Roots Alliance that IEN is a part of. And those kinds of um, sort of protests or you know, online protests that we do have been wildly successful as a result of Standing Rock. You know, Energy Transfer Partners is, is this huge con evil corporation, but I, I don't, did, did we talk about the recent victory on Monday <laughs> um, against the Bayou Bridge per permit? The Louisiana judge ruled that um, Energy Transfer Partners um, violated guidelines on their coastal use permit for this 18 mile stretch of stretch of this pipeline that would have run through St. James Parish, which I met a lot of wonderful, beautiful, amazing human beings living in an area where dozens of refineries and industrial facilities already exist and are making people sick. And uh, the judge ruled in favor of the people woo, that <laughs> energy transfer partners cannot have um, this permit because they didn't take into consideration the impacts that the project would have um, on the town. And so that just happened on Monday. And we're um, really excited that this permit is going to make, make this stop for a little while. Um, and we are also, as the Indigenous Environmental Network is also in a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit with, um, against the Keystone XL pipeline. And I, I, we're really <laughs> excited about this right now because it's coming up on uh, the 24th of this month. Uh, is going to be when we're going to find out what what motion for the summary judgment is going to happen. The summary judgment hearing is on May 24th, so people can join um, anybody in Montana. <laughs> Great, uh, Great Falls, Montana, we're going to be doing sort of a little rally on the 23rd prior to the hearing, and there's going to be other stuff that's going to be happening around the um, 24th hearing as well. Again, I think all this information will be sent out to folks. We can send you the links and information so that you can find out how you can stay connected either by being there or from afar as well. And I also want to put another shout out. Um, if people want to help for Red Fawn, for example, you just can go to her Facebook page, Free Red Fawn, there's a lot of information there for her. She is, like I said, still currently incarcerated and is gonna be sentenced May 31st. And people can send letters of support to the judge. He will read these letters and he will take them into consideration. 
And so we can send that link as well if you want to help with some of the water protectors that um, basically put their freedom on the line and are, you know, now currently incarcerated or facing incarceration. So I think it's just really important that we remember all of those that have gone before us and remember that we're still fighting uh, fire with fire and here at, you know, the Indigenous Environmental Network, all the work I do at home has basically to do with the right to not only survive, but to also thrive as individuals. And as Indigenous peoples and communities, we're often the first and worst impacted by, again, colonization and capitalism, which is continued growth without ever stopping which never was sustainable and for us simply speaking out and saying that we do all you know matter on the planet as humanity we have to understand that these connections that we have are with each other and with those that are against us they might not know why they're against us they might not know why they're introducing these bills they think that we're some kind of a threat my message to them because i know they're listening would be that we are in this together um, as humanity, it doesn't matter our age, race, color, <laughs> religious background. As humanity, we are fighting to protect the very thing that protects us, this planet. We cannot live without clean air. We cannot live without clean water. And we cannot live without clean soil. Those are the three most important natural resources of all that we should be planning on protecting. And that is why all of this dissent has come about because we care about our babies and our future generations. And we care about your babies and your future generations. It's pretty plain and simple, very much common sense. There are a lot of other ways that we could be living upon this planet and the way we're doing it right now with capitalism is not one of those ways that is going to be sustainable for any of our futures. Again, Matsikirats, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we switch to questions, I'm going to kick it to Rod. Um, we're a little bit over time, so let's be mindful um, so we can get to all the questions that our viewers um, have for us. All right, Rod. Absolutely. Hey, first, thanks, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say how much I appreciate everybody who is on this panel as well as the work putting it together. Uh, this is huge. It's really interesting to hear about other struggles around the United States, being a part of the social justice movement here in Missouri, usually has its roots in folks being uh, of uh, a darker hue or being disadvantaged in one way or another, uh, set out from society. But I, I love that the work that's going on. Let, let me say that what we're doing here in Missouri is one, calling attention to the issues that we've highlighted. Uh, to ensure that the legislation just doesn't pass like so many other things have. Last year, Missouri passed Senate Bill 43, which literally legalized individual discrimination against everybody in a protected category. That's people of color, that's women, those fo ho folks who are of faith, international people, people with disabilities, real or perceived, or over the age of 40. We don't need to follow that up with ensuring that those folks not only that they can't go to the courthouse, which is what that bill did, it prevents people from protecting their civil rights, but also to prevent uh, folks from being able to voice any kind of this uh, dissent. Uh, just yesterday, we had a reunion of the medical people of faith, uh, whether they're preachers, pastors, uh, bishops, reverends, uh, who came together to remember what plus one my person who came together to remember what it was like to be persecuted, the impact on the, the chilling fact prosecutor here uh, takes advantage of its own citizenry. Uh, so I think that uh, there are a couple of links and I'll share those in just a second to those stories just to, to see what could be done locally. Another thing that we're doing is joining together with other individuals and groups who are protesting throughout the state, that is the NAACP is doing this, to ensure that their voices are heard and that the media is there when it's time for them to be there. Uh, just as importantly, we're recording the stories of protesters so that we can share those in a variety of formats. Uh, now, I'm not sure that the legislation that's in Missouri right now is gonna pass. And let me say that more hopefully than I have just now. I don't want any of it to pass. And I don't think uh, that if things stay the same, uh, we're gonna have to face the legislation now. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that. And I hope that that stays the, the, the status. But 
I know that these efforts are huge and that they're nationally coordinated, as we, as we have already mentioned, and that we're we're going to be able to have a repository of information to share with the public. These are folks that marched with, uh, marched with Dr. King. They marched with uh, President Brooks from the NAACP when he came. These are folks that block highways, that block streets in our cities and municipalities, uh, trying to get the word out about injustices, that working families, that people in America, that people are suffering. Uh, so those are the, the, the things that we're doing, and I'd be happy to expound on any of that during the Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to transition us now to some questions that we have. So far we have, um, I will start with a question from Carolyn. Um, I'm going to direct this one to you, Maggie. This came up uh, while you were talking. Um, can our collective organizations pursue ALEC and Goldwater and others involved in creation of anti-protest model legislation? <laughs> Uh, I, like, coming up with like a creative civil suit to file against them. I'm not sure what the cause of action would be, but I love your thinking. Um, <laughs> I mean, certainly, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's smart to go to the root of the issue and what can we do to, to, to stop that. But um, a little more broadly, like we need to defeat these bills as they're being introduced and after they've been enacted, where they've been enacted, they need to fight back, whether that brings bringing legal challenges, their you know, on their face or as applied or in any other ways that we can, um, you know, extrajudicially, you know, protest in the streets. Of course, what we know, for example, ALEC, it's composed of lawmakers and lobbyists. So if you vote in different lawmakers, um, you know, those particular lawmakers won't be, will no longer be part of ALEC, uh, potentially. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Oh, it was disabled. Can I, can I quickly just share the ICNL protest tracker? Is that working? Can you all it's, can you all see it? I cannot this see right it right here. Mm -mm. Yes. No. Nope. No. Okay. Um, well, I'm trying to. So, if you go to so the International Center for Non for Profit Law um, is tracking all of these bills, um, and I highly recommend it as a great resource. I've been using it myself. Um, you can also, of course, you know, contact the actual state assembly and find out where the law is because you're, you're welcome to try now if you'd like. Oh, okay, great. Um, can you let me if that doesn't work I recommend dropping the link in the chat so I did that already um, but I just want to make sure oh, I can, okay okay so this is um, the International Center for non for profit laws um, protest law tracker and uh, you can see the status of various you can click on for example specific issues if you're concerned about campus speech apply the filter and here you'll see there's a, a in Georgia there is a campus speech bill still pending and so forth. Um, so I highly recommend you go here um, and learn about what's happening in your state. Um, and then uh, you can contact your lawmakers. You can attend hearings. You can um, get involved in civic, you know, kind of actions that way. Of course, not you know, please hit the streets too. That's my answer. <laughs> right, stop share. Okay. Christine, I don't think we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I just realized I was like, I wonder if anybody can actually hear me. You saw my mouth moving. Our next question is from Lupe in Oregon. Does in and Candy, this came up um, while you were talking, so I believe this one's for you. Um, does anyone have experience with fossil fuel industries personally funding a law enforcement division? If so, how was it addressed? And this is broadly open to everyone, but I just wanted to poke you first, Candy. Well, we had to get mute, yeah. <laughs> Did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it got brought up um, again during Standing Rock 2, and there was a court case recently about um, Tiger Swan operating in the state of North Dakota and who was actually paying them and were they doing it illegally. Um, so while there isn't any actual, that I'm aware of, specific ties to them being paid by you know, law enforcement, I mean, it's clear, it's very clear that law enforcement was getting paid with taxpayers' dollars to step in between us and the pipeline and to protect the pipeline interests over those of the people who are trying to protect 
the water. And a judge recently ruled that it's not illegal for Tiger Swan and it wasn't illegal for Tiger Swan to um, operate in North Dakota. So it, <laughs> it's one of those things where I can say that it's clear that people get paid off and people are in the pockets of the industry, but I didn't necessarily have the smoking gun um, because they go really, they do a lot to cover their tracks. But others might have more um, specific, you might have that smoking gun that shows that you know, people are being paid. And then a lot of times I think with the law enforcement too, they might be put into a situation that they don't even know the full story around. I felt like there was a lot of officers that I was looking at that were like, hey, I'm just here doing my job. You know, I, I'm just doing what I'm told. And you guys are the bad people. And what happened, if you read The Intercept on all of those different stories, there were people that were paid to make us look like the ones that were bad. There were people that were paid to like pour oil on the Capitol building in Bismarck while the um, Standing Rock thing was happening. There were people that were killing Buffalo. And these were um, like, cr these are the criminals. <laughs> and the companies themselves are the criminals because they didn't even follow the law. So had energy transfer partners followed the law and did an environmental impact statement and did what they were supposed to do in the first place, none of that would have happened. So they're the ones actually breaking the law and legally getting away with it. Thank you for your response. I'm gonna move us on to the next question. This one is for Rod. Um, this is from Bell. We've been talking a lot about environmental protest. What other movements do you think have overlapped on these issues? Oh, well, I mean, uh, certainly our, our social justice uh, work that uh, is going on here in Missouri and throughout the United States. Um, interestingly, I think the NAACP has uh, gained a stronger footing in some of the environmental work that we've been talking about. Uh, if there's a, uh, well, th there are a couple of different areas here in Missouri where there are some big issues, whether it's in Bannister, uh, that uh, there was a waste that's causing cancer, or literally in St. Louis where uh, there is a site at the dump uh, where parts of the Manhattan Project are buried. It's actually on fire. Uh, there, there've been, there's been work over there. Um, I, I think that right now we're at a place in Missouri for sure, in the Midwest, and I think across the country, where there's a growing intolerance for some of the conduct that we've seen. You know, right there in Sacramento, for example, uh, I understand that there's been great protests there. And I say great, people bringing a voice to the injustice that's been experienced there. Uh, and we know that that's taken place with murders that have occurred throughout the United States and other places. Uh, and in part, even recognition uh, through the lynching museum in, uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. I think that's important too, because this is just uh, another link in a long saga of some lives being valued a hell of a lot more than others. Uh, and what people are gonna do in order to keep injustice from continuing to occur. Thank you for your response. Um, our next question, uh, back to you, Candy. Can you repeat the name of the bank tracking group that you recommended people access and get involved with? If you go to bankongood.org, it'll take you to the link for Mazaska Talks. They're good at, I'm gonna get teased. I always say that, <laughs> that word wrong, but it's not a Hiradza word. That's why it's <laughs> Mazaska, <laughs> the way you're supposed to pronounce it. Um, so go there. And just a follow up to that last one, it's not just environmental issues. There's also cultural sites and cultural issues that are being totally impacted that people feel that they have to protest, which I don't say protest, I say protect. So I wanna put a shout out out there for Bears Ears National Monument, for example, which in, was in this administration was unprecedented move to take that away. And that's a cultural, cultural site. And then Mauna Kea in uh, Hawaii, which is also a cultural site, which is under attack. So it's also about our culture as well. I stopped there. <laughs> Great, thank you. I just had some things pop up at my screen. <laughs> One last question for everyone. So this will wrap us. Um, we had a question from an anonymous person um, asking each of the panelists to recommend one clear thing that individuals can do to fight criminalization of protest, if you have that one clear thing. And Irina, would you like to start us? Sure. Um, no, 
I'm, I'm going to make a meta suggestion because this is, this is I think this is this is a meta question. Um, one thing I'll say is let's not let's not let our movements uh, be divided. Um, when you hear about people taking action for environmental or racial justice or economic justice or whatever, don't don't fall into the good bad protester divide because that just ends up harming all of us. Thank you, Candy. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, knowledge is power. And so I really like the um, link that Maggie shared about tracking the bills in the different states. And then if it's in your state or if you can help in that way, I would probably do as far as this specific topic around um, protectors being legally looked at. Let's not pass these let these bills pass that are really really bad bills we were successful in north dakota of all places of killing two bills if we can do it there you can do it in other places as well but also divestment i already said it but i'm going to put a plug in again watch where you're using and spending and how the banks are using and spending your money thank you maggie sure um no matter what you're passionate about and where you live someone's already working on the issue find out who they are, what they're doing, get involved and support them. Perfect. And last but not least, Rod, please. So I issue a challenge. Uh, send a video, a link, you know, to, uh, to I'm going to post an email here just at nimrodchapeljr at gmail.com of what it means to protest, what it means to you to protest, why you're doing it, who you're protecting. And I think that that'll say in those minutes, maybe one or two or three, what a hundred letters could. Uh, we're collecting that information. We hope to make that available to everybody online. Uh, and it's something that I think could be used as a bank nationally to share with legislators uh, who may not share our, our same concerns. Wonderful, perfect way to end this. So from there, I'm gonna go ahead and um, wrap up our time together today. I wanna thank all of you for your questions, for your comments, and most of all, thank you to the experts who joined us today. Um, we'll make this recording available, um, this webcast available within the next few days. So if you learned something today, I encourage you to share it with others. That's our one thing that you can do. And on behalf of the entire Stand Our Earth team, thank you so much for joining us and have a powerful afternoon. Bye, Maggie, please. Thank you. Thank you.